All right, welcome back to the Copywriters Podcast with your host, the world's greatest copywriting coach, David Garfinkel. David, how are you doing today, man? Nathan, I'm good. How are you? I'm excited for two reasons. Number one, you for the video viewers of the podcast, you have a new background and it looks freaking awesome. And it you mentioned right before we went live that it looks like you have a new camera, but it's just the way the camera is set towards the background. It looks amazing. So I'm excited about that. And then I'm also excited because we're about to revisit one of the I'm going to say one of the biggest gold nuggets that I've ever got from working with you on this podcast, and we're going to do a deep dive on it. So I'm super excited about this week's episode. Cool. Well, shall we jump in? Yeah, let's do it, man. Okay. Well, today we're going to take a deep dive into neuroscience, which is basically the study of how the brain works. Now, deep breath. This is not a med school class. In fact, to the great disappointment of my mother, I never went to med school, and I never will. Sorry, Mom. No, this is about how the brain works when you're reading the written word. It's very specific, and it applies to how people take in and accept or reject what you've written. So it's narrowly focused, and it's great for copywriters. It's from a book called Wired for Story, The Writer's Guide to Using Brain Science to Hook Readers from the Very First Sentence by Lisa Crone. She really knows her stuff when it comes to stories. She's worked with major publishers and movie studios, plus she teaches at UCLA Extension in the Writer's Program. And what she says for novelists and screenwriters is also hugely important for copywriters because as writers, We all face the same problems, how to get people reading, how to keep them reading, and how to get them to buy into what you've written. And we'll dig into some details in a moment. But first, I know you'll really dig this. Copy is powerful. You're responsible for how you use what you hear on this podcast. And most of the time, common sense is all you need. But if you make extreme claims, and or if you're writing copy for offers in highly regulated industries like health, finance, and business opportunity, you may want to get a legal review after you write and before you start using your copy. My larger clients do this all the time. So let me tell you a little about this book because it has a strong copywriting connection right from the start. Eight years ago, a big name in copywriting told me about this book but he made me promise not to tell anyone else about it. I kept my promise, and a couple years after that, he said it was okay to share the info with others. Four years ago, I mentioned it briefly on this podcast, as Nathan just mentioned, in a group of books I was recommending for copywriters to read. But we didn't go into any detail at the time like we're going to do today. Recently, I read it again, and there were tons of things I saw in it that I hadn't seen the first time. The book didn't change, so it must have been me. Now, what we're going to talk about is not complicated or technical. After all, the neuroscience has already been processed and dumbed down by a writer in a book for writers. But I think what you're going to hear opens up some new possibilities for writing easier and coming up with much better copy. So let's get started with our five secrets. Our first secret is big words, little emotion. Lisa Crone, the author of the book, says this as clearly and specifically as anyone I've ever heard say it. The bigger the word, the less emotion it produces. Because the part of the brain that processes big words is not the same as the part of the brain that drives powerful emotions. You may already know this, but the chances are better than good that you're not keeping this in mind all the time when you write, not as much as you should. Let me first give you an over-the-top example to make my point. This sentence. He felt uncomfortably lugubrious that his friend exhibited intense and malevolent animosity over what he had done. Lots of big words. Boy, do I have a big vocabulary, huh? And compare (laughs) it to this one. 
he was really sad that his friend was pissed because of what he had done. Quite a difference, right? Very few people, except English majors who can't resist the temptation to show up, would write a sentence like the first one, he felt uncomfortably lugubrious, etc. Much less a copywriter who wouldn't write it, except me to be contrarian and to show you what not to do. But let's look at what copywriters do with words that are too big for emotional impact, but not quite as obvious, and how you can improve that kind of sentence. So you, as a copywriter, might write a sentence like this. When he got the package, he could barely control his curiosity and enthusiasm. He interrupted his carefully scheduled day and impatiently started unpacking his new product at a frantic pace. All right, that's not stripped of emotion entirely. I mean, you can tell how motivated he was, but it's quite a mouthful. How about instead... The minute it arrived, he couldn't wait to open the package. He stopped everything and ripped it open. Can you feel the excitement a lot more in the second example? I sure could. Now, here are a couple of questions you can ask yourself to help you get the best emotional impact from using shorter words. And the point here is not to use the shortest word no matter what. What this secret is all about is using shorter words and simpler sentences, especially when you want to convey strong emotions. So here are a couple questions you can ask yourself. Is there a shorter way to say this? Will the reader get the feeling I'm trying to get across without having to think about it at all? Two other things that I want to add to that. Number one, by making shorter words and shorter sentences to try and get the same point across in a faster way, we're getting people through the sales letter faster and to where we want them faster. And especially in today's age when everybody's uh, got a thousand different things weighing on their plate or or vying for their attention, we want to make sure that we're not wasting their time. The other thing is, I've heard you mention this before, the greased slide effect. Whenever somebody has to stop and think about what a word means, it pulls them out of the copy. It's like a speed bump on the greased slide. And we want to make sure that we're avoiding all of those if we possibly can. Yeah, two two great points. Um, Secret number two, pictures and specifics. The next point is about generalities. By generalities, I don't mean full-on statements. I'm talking about words that convey big picture ideas. Speaking and writing in generalities may be very impressive, but generalities don't work in stories, and they don't work in copy either. Now, careful here. Because generalities and broad concepts are seductive. They appeal to the intellectual part of the brain. You may think they will work when they won't work. Because when, say, you're trying to get a fiction reader riveted to your story, the generalities fly right over the radar. People understand generalities, but they don't feel them. When you're trying to connect with the prospect and you want them to buy something, generalities almost never work at all. And so what are generalities anyway? So here's an example a lot of us can relate to with generalities weighing it down. Elmer had a longstanding fear of excessive taxation, and this interfered with his business development. Um, An entrepreneur with a few years' experience will instantly understand this. However, especially for copy being understood is not good enough. Of course, if you're against high taxes and you're into growing businesses, then the sentence probably resonates with you, but it contains generalities and it won't do a good enough job of stirring emotions. The generalities are excess taxation and business development. So how do you know if something is general or specific? Lisa Crone, the author, has a really simple test. If you can picture it, if you can't picture it, it's general. If you can see it, it's specific. No picture, general. Picture, specific. And that's a pretty simple test, all right. So let's look at the sentence again now. Elmer had a longstanding fear of excessive taxation, and this interfered with his business development. Can you visualize what excessive taxation is? 
Not really. What do they look like? They probably look different to, or what does it look like? Probably looks different to every other person. Whenever I've paid high taxes, there was always a specific number. It's painful even to think about a specific number on a specific check. I can see the ink on the check and read the number. I really want to move on to the next topic. Nathan. I'm starting to um, <laughs> number in my mind. It's painful to remember, but I can see it. And the same thing for business development. That too is a generality. I don't know what business development looks like. I know what it is, but I can't make a picture of it in my mind. Now, let's take the same thing and make it specific. Elmer had always been afraid of having to pay more than 40 cents in taxes for every dollar he earned. So when he found an easy path to double his business, he froze because the extra 10 cents of taxes he'd have to pay for each new dollar he made. I can see 40 cents. I can see a dollar. I can see doubling a business. And I can see that extra 10 cents. It looks like buckets and buckets and buckets of dimes to me. Buckets that Elmer didn't want to give to the government. Now, here's the advantage of writing with specifics this way. People against high taxes will still instantly resonate with Elmer's dilemma. But more important, now that we can see specifics, they'll also feel his pain, very visceral level. And people who didn't think about taxes much before, the way this story is so specific, it may wake them up to a problem they didn't realize they would eventually have as the number of dollars going into their own bank accounts got larger. When you can picture a story in your mind, you can put yourself in the shoes of the person the story is about. But generalities don't even wear shoes. Well, except maybe podiatric generalities, but even then they would only be general shoes. So good question to ask about stories in reality, or most, even all of your copy is, can the reader picture this without having to do any mental work on their own? If the answer is yes, we're all set. If the answer is no, you've got to rewrite it until the answer is yes. The other thing to think about too, is that generalities lose trust. So if it says we've helped people save a lot of money, I don't know what you mean by a lot of money. So that to you, that might be $3 to me. That doesn't help me at all. Or since January, we've increased businesses, products, bottom line. Okay. That's very general. I don't know if that's by 1% or by 18%. So if you, if you're afraid to say the actual number a lot of times, or if you're afraid to be actually, uh, very specific, a lot of times people think that you're using the general term as a weasel word to avoid saying what the actual number is or the actual promise is. Yeah, I agree totally. And, um, very often you can catch a bullshit artist or a liar con man um, because they start using generalities. But there is another side to this, too. Um, a lot of us fall in love with ideologies, including me. You know, uh, we might like the idea of entrepreneurship or freedom or personal growth or things like that. And so those things really resonate with us. And we tend to confuse the... Um, the feeling we have of fascination and um, uh, fulfillment from exploring those things and talking about them with um, the more visceral um, old brain, older parts of the brain reactions of specifics. Do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, cool. All right, let's move on to secret number three, reason why. So students of copywriting know John E. Kennedy came up with the term reason why copywriting, and this has evolved into a very important technique and approach. But there's more to the idea of reason why that neuroscience has uncovered, and it's important to know about this. What Lisa Krohn says in the book several times across the book is, neurologically, the brain is constantly checking things to see if they make sense all the time. If something doesn't make sense, the brain goes on alert to find out what's going on and if anything's wrong. The reader's brain, 
my brain, your brain, every brain. You might remember Mark Twain's famous quote, it's no wonder that truth is stranger than fiction. Fiction has to make sense. And he's right. Well, mainly, fiction doesn't have to make sense. But in order to get read, it does. And the same thing is true with copy. Once the reader starts to get confused, they get suspicious. You've probably heard the phrase, the confused mind does not buy. Now you know the reason why. It's especially important to give a believable and hopefully true reason when you do something unexpected, like offer a discount. If you don't, the reader will make up their own reason. Oh, he's offering a discount because it's not really that good and can't sell it. Or, oh, he's offering a discount because he's desperate for money. When they make up reasons like that, it's not going to help your sales. So make sure your reason is there and you explain it anywhere in the copy where it isn't already totally obvious and the obvious implied reason isn't already in your favor in terms of closing the sale. So how does this how does this impact the part of our brain that is like pattern seeking because i know a lot of times um especially like uh conspiracy theories are really hot right now and a lot of times people attribute to conspiracy things that probably aren't conspiracies but because their brain is looking for a pattern they're like they see patterns that aren't there and if we can't find the pattern we're very discomforting or discomforted with something so um pattern seeking part of our brain does that kind of fall into this at all yeah yeah um it's pretty much the same thing um or maybe it's not exactly the same thing but it's closely related she talks about that a lot um the brain is constantly seeking patterns so at the base of it we're trying to survive we're trying to be safe I mean, this is what our brain's always doing. Everything is sort of a branch off of that tree. Uh, we're trying to um, predict what's going to happen in the future. We're trying to figure out causes and effects. And when we don't get clear and um, plausible explanations, we'll start to make stuff up. And um, Or we, we may... If, if there is a true explanation that is not being clearly and convincingly articulated, a conspiracy theory um, will step into its place. So it's important to alleviate that, that natural tendency in your reader's brain by clearly laying out the reason why. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. So let's, let's move on. I got a couple more secrets. Um, these are really good. Details matter, but details can clutter. Hmm, what does that mean? We were talking about specifics before, before and how details people can visualize to make a story land with impact. Okay. It would seem that the logical conclusion from that would be more better. That is, the more details, the better. But it ain't necessarily so, warns Lisa Crone. Here's how she describes it. I love this part. Here's how she describes it in Wired for Story. Think of each detail as an egg. The writer keeps tossing them at us one after another, seemingly unaware of the number of precariously balanced eggs we're asked to hold. When it gets to be one too many, we don't just drop that particular egg. All the eggs go crashing to the ground. So, putting this in practical terms. In 1956, a Harvard psychology professor named George Miller published something in an academic journal called The Magic Number 7, Plus or Minus 2. 7 minus 2 is 5, 7 plus 2 is 9. His main idea was that the brain can only keep between 5 and 9 things in awareness, in conscious awareness at the same time. And University research has since confirmed this idea. And if you think about it, unless you have some really unusual skills or an affliction, this is probably true for you too. When it comes to copy, 
Therefore, you don't want to flood your reader with details. You want to pick ones that are most relevant and most likely to win your prospect over to becoming a customer. So let's say you're selling a knife sharpener. Here's what you don't want to do. Our knife sharpener is made of tungsten, ceramic, and ABS plastic. You don't have to worry about dull knives. And even if you have high-end knives with a sharpening rod you've never been able to use effectively, you don't have to worry. You can sharpen those knives with our knife sharpener too. It would probably even work on plastic knives, although to be honest, the shavings would be a mess to clean up and you really only want to use a plastic knife once anyway. Ever try to cut a tomato with a dull knife? Forget about it. Plus, got any porcelain knives? Because even porcelain knives get sharpened well with this sharpener and you can use it both at home and in your RV. And cheese! This sharpener is great for cheese knives, but some words to the wise, if you use it for knives that cut really soft, creamy cheeses like brie or camembert, be sure to clean the knife thoroughly before you run it through the sharpener. You don't want a film of cheese coming up the works. Are you kidding? Lots of details and more than half of them useful, but this is a classic example of too much information and copy detail. Now, excuse me for a second while I go get a slice of goat gouda. Now, all right, I'll stay here. I'll do that after the show. Let's try again. Our knife sharpener is reliable and easy to use. High quality materials, including tungsten and ceramic, means it will get your knives very sharp, very fast. No expensive trips to the store to get something else to sharpen your knife for you. The casing is durable ABS plastic, so you can be sure it will last a long time. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to take you guys like behind the scenes a little bit. <laughs> After I did this exercise, I actually bought the knife sharpener. <laughs> I was not planning. To. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, you know, the easiest person to sell, etc. All right. Um, so um, here are questions you can ask yourself to uh, use this. Number one, did you include all the important details? And two, how many can you take out and still give people enough detail to make them confident in buying what you're selling? One last thing. You can only show the universal through the specific. And this one's a little bit of a brain twister. It's an Interesting twist on specifics that reveals the secrets of great characters in movies, hit songs, and blockbuster sales copy. Let's talk universals, not Universal Studios. A universal is something any human being would recognize. Fear, love, anticipation. They're feelings everyone has experienced at one time or another. But that doesn't mean they'll work unadorned as they are in copy. In fact, they won't. And this is one of those highly counterintuitive things. You can't convey the universal, these broad swaths of common, deeply meaningful experiences by talking about the universal. The way that works emotionally in writing is to talk about them through specifics. Now, besides from Lisa Crone, I also learned about this in songwriting. I saw a quote once from Kenny Loggins, which said, the secret to his songwriting is a personal connection. He said, I needed to write music that touched my heart, that had something to do with who I am and where I am in my life. He said, and, and this is the important part. And the deeper I could go with that, the more likely it would touch other people. And Bruce Springsteen said it differently in an interview with Trevor Noah on The Daily Show. Noah asked him, how come his songs reach so many different kinds of people? And Springsteen said, it was my personal experience, but it covered the same emotional geography other people had. I like that phrase, emotional geography, the first time I ever heard it. So this would, this explain the universal only through specifics was a tough concept for me to understand. But since Lisa Crone is saying the same thing in an even more scientific way, I am certain it's true. Plus, I've talked to people over and over again who've told me their own big breakthroughs, especially as public figures in a niche, only happen when they reached 
inside to share with the world what was going on with them emotionally. So that doesn't have to be you with your copy. You don't need to mount a huge personal emotional reveal to take advantage of this. You just need to remember that when you want to get your reader to experience love, you need to talk about someone being in love or yourself being in love or asking them about being in love and it, or expressing love. And maybe someone you're writing about, one of the characters in your copy. And when you need to invoke fear, tell a story about someone who's afraid with the details and why. And if they overcame it, you can write about what they did in specific detail that people can see in a picture in their minds. Okay, that's about it. Just a quick question. Um, a lot of times writing these emotions it seems shoehorned or it seems forced a lot of a lot of people when i read their copy or when i read even fiction books to pull this off is kind of difficult to to actually convey these emotions without we we say as writers you want to show don't tell so i just I guess I, I'd like to know if you have any tips on how to convey these messages or these these emotions without being overly heavy-handed. It's, it's not something I have a lot of experience with. But what I do know is you've got to feel it if you want them to feel it. You have to become a bit of a method actor or any other kind of actor um, in order to be able to convey it. And this is difficult for a lot of people, especially if it's an uncomfortable emotion. But you have to remember what it was like. You have to put yourself mentally in that place. And then you might not want to use the first words that you write down. Uh, a lot of people want to, you know, get gold stars, pat themselves on the back because they used emotion. But it's like any other writing. The first thing you write down might not be it. You might need to go back and redo it um, um, until it comes across as smooth. I, I, th I think it's one of the hardest things to do well in writing, but it's something, you know, uh, a lot of people say that copywriting is about fear and greed. I think it's about more than that, but I, I think you need to, you know, be able to, um, uh, convey those things. So I don't, don't have a, you know, instant solution as much as I'd like to. Um, I, I think the thing that I see the most often is someone will say, Lisa was scared instead of saying something like Lisa's breath, uh, or Lisa ha was having trouble breathing and her heart skipped a beat and a chill went down her spine or Jim was very excited instead of saying Jim was so filled with anticipation, he could barely hold it in. And then when the time came, he almost burst. There's like these little things where I, I think it takes a while of writing and it takes a while of, of, being able to actually remember how you felt in that situation and the body, what your body was doing and what your mind was going through rather than just saying, Lisa felt like she was in love. Um, it's, it's one of those things that separates. It's, it's one of those little subtle things that separates um, a writer who can really pull you in emotionally versus a writer who tries to force you into an emotion. Yeah. Um, now I see what you're getting at, and and that's true. That kind of gets back to generalities. I mean, if you use an emotion as a generality, as opposed to talk about the experience of it through behavior, through um, uh, physical action, uh, through um, mostly through physical action, I guess, um, or through choices a person's making. You know, one of the things from the book that I really liked is, you know, the body never lies and neither does body language. And often people will lie with their words. So, you know, if, if you have someone and he says, I'm not scared, she said, as every bone in her body was shaking, you kind of know what's going on without having to, you know, put it on the nose as they say in the film i think that was actually the the perfect example to explain what i was trying to get at um david 
<laughs> again, I'm just going to say when you first mentioned this book four years ago, wow, it's been a while that we've been doing this podcast. When you first mentioned this book, it was one of the, one of the like golden nuggets. It was one of the things that it was my secret weapon for so many years. And, uh, I'm glad that we came back and kind of did a deeper dive on it this week. Yeah, I think you might have taken in more from it at that time than I had. Um, but I've, I've learned how to read stuff, you know, take a lot of notes. And actually, I was, I was reading this deleted discussion in my book discussion group. So I figured I really had the master material. I said, shit, this would be great for our podcast. So that's how it happened. Nice. All right. And if the listener wants to check out more, you can always head over to copywriterspodcast.com. Make sure that you're subscribed on your favorite podcast app. And until next time, we will catch you later. See you later.